The table. A rite of passage for any woodworker. Traditional, modern, rustic, industrial, shaker, contemporary. So many styles that all have the same end result. A flat surface to sit around, place things on, and eat things off of. There are infinite combinations of materials, shapes, and sizes, not to mention the infinite number of ways to build one. You can slap one together really quick with construction grade lumber. Functional? Yes. You could also buy a kit at a Swedish big box store, but one might argue that what you get in convenience and trendiness lacks in true quality and character. But this isn't about the table. This is about the pursuit of happiness and fulfillment, taking all of my life's little pieces and turning them into something worth admiring, a legacy, just like a handcrafted table. I wanted to document or tell my story of pursuing happiness via woodworking full time. And just like a table, there are many pieces to this story put together to achieve an end result that could potentially last longer than me. I quit my job to become a woodworker. I got a job at a life insurance company working in a call center. Oddly enough, when I accepted the job, I didn't even realize that it was a call center job. I thought it was going to be behind the scenes processing stuff, not talking to people. The phones were not my cup of tea, but I stuck it out for a little while, about two years, until a processing position opened up and I got off the phones and took that job. For the next six years, I worked as a financial processor dealing with people's life insurance policies. What does this have to do with woodworking? Nothing yet, but we'll get there. At some point in this cubicle journey, the company rolled out a work from home program. It started out as a once a week kind of thing, then two days, and then eventually over time working to a point where I only had to be in the office once a month. During this time, I had a side hustle as a videographer. This was basically my creative outlet outside of the cube job. And when my wife had our first son, that side hustle had to be put on hold while we adjusted to life with the new baby. Now here's where some seeds were planted. While working from home, I often had a second monitor pulled up for background noise or for browsing on breaks and lunches. I came across an article on household storage hacks. There were a few little things made with a simple jigsaw and some other nails or screws, which is really all I had in the way of tools. Well, that and a hammer. Anyway, they seemed easy enough and would add some more storage to the spaces that were not utilized, mainly the insides of cabinet doors. I made a little cutting board holder and a little hook thingy that would hold our measuring cups and spoons. Crazy complicated stuff, I know. So from there, I got hooked on hacking my home storage. Here's where my life course adjusted a degree and a seed was planted. I had a new creative outlet that could keep me busy at home that didn't require other people. I started looking up YouTube videos on storage hacks and somewhere in the YouTube algorithm I was introduced to Steve Ramsey. He had a bunch of videos for beginner woodworkers and one of the projects was a small table you could make from pallet wood with a hammer and nails and a jigsaw. I had these tools. I scoured Craigslist for free pallet wood, got a few pallets and built this little table. This table. Not much to look at unless you liked warp boards and exposed nails but it was oddly sturdy. I couldn't get enough of these simple DIY projects. I became a pallet connoisseur. I was always on the lookout for pallets headed to trash piles. I quickly learned that pallets behind grocery stores are no good. Colored pallets usually meant chemicals. The sweet spot was office supply stores. At these stores, they usually had clean, non-leaking products that didn't smash up the pallets in the process. Anyway, around the same time, I started picking the brain of a coworker I used to sit next to in the call center. His name was Ron. He gave me some advice on woodworking, which I'll pass on to you now. This can be a very expensive hobby to get into. Instead of buying all the tools you think you need at once, try buying a new tool with each project. So that's what I did, and still do to some degree depending on the complexity of the piece I'm working on. With each new tool comes an opportunity to try something new, which in turn creates a new skill that opens up new doors. He actually sold me my first table saw for 40 bucks, it was an old Ryobi that was super loud, and became the heart of my workshop for quite some time before I upgraded. Side note with a little flash forward. After the upgrade, I held onto that little saw, just like Ron did as a just-in-case saw for a few years. I ended up selling that little saw to another guy just getting into woodworking. And it's interesting how we perceive ourselves. Our perspective doesn't always adjust in real time with our experiences. Sometimes you have to see something or someone that has fresh eyes to understand how far you've come. When I sold that little table saw, in my mind I was still figuring it out as a beginning woodworker. And the guy that I sold it to, he was looking at me and my shop like I was some kind of seasoned pro. I could see myself in him from five years earlier, so excited to step my game up, and now I could saw so many pallet boards. And back to the meat of the story. I continued on as a hobbyist woodworker for a while and started thinking, it'd be great to get out of this job and do this full time. My life course was adjusting a couple more degrees. I'm a believer that if you truly want something, the universe will conspire to make it a reality. I read that in The Alchemist and I've heard it so many times from others since. So I kept right on thinking. 
I want to do this full time. It sure would be nice to do this full time. The problem was I never actually put a plan into action and had no clear exit strategy from corporate America. Also, I have trouble initiating big changes, so full-time woodworking was a very distant dream or reality. This corporate job provided me with a comfortable life, nights and weekends off, health care, vacation, 401k match, and I would have to give that explanation every time someone asked what I did. While at this company, I got married, bought my first house, had my first son, sold my first house, and bought a new house. I was living the comfortable American dream, but there was always a part of me that felt unfulfilled. As I built more and more beginner projects, my wife was getting more and more annoyed with the sawdust I was creating in the garage and tracking into the house. Her solution was, why don't we just build you a shop detached from the house? I couldn't believe she was serious. Really? So we did. This was the first bit of foreshadowing that my wife saw a dream more clearly realized than I did. I consulted my contractor father-in-law for a materials list and got to work. I framed it with a friend and insulated it, hired my brother-in-law to add a roof and drywall the inside and paint it, and then I wired it up with more help from my father-in-law. That's the backstory for the most part. Now I had a dust-free garage, a shop full of useless scraps and pallet wood, a growing set of intermediate tools, and the idea that one day this could be something. Exactly what? I wasn't sure, but the potential was, well, something. In February of 2018, I had a very big pivoting point. The corporate job that made everything safe and comfortable now had an end date. We received an email that one of the branches was closing. This meant that those jobs would be coming to Nashville, where I was, and my job was moving up north to Lansing, Michigan, where the home office was. This transition would last no longer than September of 2018, so I had seven months to figure out my next step and get a plan into action. I was given three options. The first was a relocation package where I would move up north and keep my job, but that wasn't even an idea we were entertaining. Option two was to apply for one of the jobs coming to Nashville. These were mostly sales and marketing jobs, and I even had a few people in upper management urge me to pursue one of these positions, but again, not for me. At some point a while back, I had decided, and this was another degree or two of course deviation if you're keeping track, unless an open position or new job was going to bring me closer to my goal of a creative or fulfilling job, I wasn't going to hop into another cubicle where work from home wasn't an option, only to make a little more money. I really enjoyed the freedom of walking out of my office to see the smiling faces of my wife and son and not having to sit in a car an hour and a half each day in commute time. That's seven and a half hours a week, 30 hours a month, or roughly 360 hours a year. That's 15 whole days, two whole weeks, and then some. That's a long vacation, sitting in my car, just to keep a job where I would sit unfulfilled for an additional eight hours a day. I'm not even going to get into the depressing long-term math behind that one. Option three work through the transition period, and take the severance when the time ran out. I immediately started looking for jobs in the same line of work, processor jobs, project management, operations, and then I came across an opening for a video editor and something clicked. My course corrected a couple more degrees. Why was I looking for more of the job I hated? I could be looking for something I actually had a passion for. Fast forward two months, an old roommate friend from college posted something on Facebook asking if anyone knew anything about building furniture from pallets. I don't know if you remember, but my roots were in pallet woodworking. I shot him a message thinking he probably had a backyard project of some sort. He came over to talk about it, and it turned out he was now the GM of a bar on Broadway in downtown Nashville, and they wanted to completely revamp the rooftop seating. I had never done anything like this before. How would I get the materials? How would I find the time? I don't even have a truck. How would I deliver these? I said yes. I was hustling on nights and weekends to build two-seaters and modular sectionals, and then something happened after I got my first check. The distant dream with no plan just got its first actual breath. During the time I was making this furniture, I was actually making more money building with pallet wood than I was making at the corporate job. People do this. I could do this. I could actually see, truly for the first time, a different future. It was like someone grabbed the wheel and gave it a big spin. I was veering way off the life course I had previously charted for myself. With the support of my wife, we decided to take option three and run my time out at the corporate gig through September. Now, there are a couple other layers to peel back on this onion. In February of 2018, when I got the news about the job ending, my wife was only two months away from having our second son. There were many loops and ups and downs on this decision-making roller coaster. After my wife had our first child, when she returned to work, she only went back part-time so that she could be more hands-on with raising our new son. Another side note, we are firm believers in being debt-free. We are disciplined savers and spenders within our means. The less money we were paying out to others, the more freedom we would have to make decisions on our own accord. We really wanted to live a life that wasn't dictated by the bills we had to pay. Could woodworking be enough to sustain our lifestyle? 
Childcare is no joke, and for two kids, it's even more serious. I can't even imagine more than two. The cost to have two young kids in childcare was only a couple hundred dollars less than what I was making at my corporate gig, so part of the decision was, if we both work at this part-time, on the days she's working, I'll watch the kids, and on the days she's off, I'll be out in my shop. Then I'll only need to make a few hundred dollars to essentially offset what we would have been spending in childcare costs. This is doable. Not sure if this was concrete logic, but I, we made it make sense at the time. Another layer was personal time and freedom. This might seem counterintuitive as any new business owner knows you eat, sleep, and breathe your business starting out. There is no extra time or freedom. But what I needed was time to see my mom and the freedom from a job to visit her at the drop of a hat without covering schedules or worrying about running out of my vacation or sick days. My mom was diagnosed with cancer around 2015 and there was a new sense of urgency to spend more time with her. She lived about 11 hours away, so in a normal year, I'd visit home usually twice to see her and the rest of my family. This meant, hypothetically, if she had five more years to live, I only had about 10 more visits with her on this current path. The day after my corporate job ended in 2018, we used my severance to buy a minivan, packed up the kids, and headed home to visit for a couple weeks. So basically, I started self-employment with a two-week vacation. I wouldn't recommend this, but I was early in my journey of realizing that life has no set rules. I was visiting back home about every other month or so, so needless to say, there were no big strides in this business. I was figuring this whole thing out on my own. I was going business to business around our town square to get my name out there. I attended small business seminars and free classes at the Small Business Development Center. It was a rough go at first, but again, my priority was maximizing my time with my mom. She passed in March of 2020, and the very next day, the U.S. went into lockdown. I made my way back to Tennessee, and something began to happen around June. Orders started coming in. I was no longer working on one project at a time, but rather I actually had projects on the books. I had to schedule my work and tell my clients there was a waiting period, which is where I am at today. Intention and hard work breeds results. Who would have thought? When I decided I wanted to pursue a hobby that turned into a passion as a full-time woodworker, I also had the idea that I would build my skill set and be making at least what I was making in my corporate job before I took the leap. The universe has a funny way of conspiring. I didn't plan my exit strategy, work out the details, and give a two-week notice, and then take the leap. No, no, no. The universe said, hey, you've been sitting long enough. You've got seven months to figure it out, and then that cliff over there, I'm pushing you off of it. Leap or not, you're going over that cliff. In hindsight, I could have quit my job at any point in my corporate career and figured it out just like I did. Honestly, I was just too scared to bet on myself. Gary Vaynerchuk said, quit your shitty job, you can always get another shitty job. Dave Ramsey said, be debt-free and live now like no one else, so later you can live like no one else. Tony Robbins told me to change my expectations for appreciation. Ron said, I'm not staining this oak. I also became a collector of self-improvement quotes at some point. But there was one that stuck out and keeps me going. I can't remember where I heard it, but it was something along the lines of, how can I look my child in the eyes and tell them to follow their dreams when I'm not following my own? We all want a legacy to leave. And that quote or idea really became the cornerstone of my decisions and how I wanted my sons to remember me. All of that to say, if you have a dream, chase it. Figure out what little pieces need to be in place and then go for it. And be open to reworking the plan as you go. I mean, 95% of woodworking is covering the mistakes you made. Am I right? Find a job you would do for free anyway and you'll be set. Get yourself out of debt and make decisions based on what you want to do and not what you have to do. Lastly, this is my story. It's not your story. It's not your circumstance. It's mine. I'm sure I'll get a lot of the easy for you to say kind of comments, but none of this was really easy. This little story is the summation of years of small decisions, chances, choices, and one degree of movements that eventually shifted me so far off the soul crushing course I was on that I could see newer, better, exciting things on a new course that frankly, I'm still charting out. Just like this table, there are literally thousands of species of wood to choose from. How many different designs? Can you even count how many ways and methods there are to construct it? What's the order of operations? What is the joinery? Will we stain it? Some people would never use stain. Others would. How do you finish it? Oil? Poly? Wax? Epoxy? There are many paths to build a table just like there are many paths to happiness. In the end, I gathered all of my materials in tiny pieces, sorted out the plans, reworking them as I went and built a table in the same way I found my path to happiness by taking note of all the tiny little pieces of my life, figuring out which pieces were most important, sorting out my plans, reworking those plans, and finding happiness in a new passion that came out of circumstances completely unrelated to woodworking itself. To condense this story, I had to leave many details out, but I'm an open book, so if you have any questions, comments, inspirational quotes, etc., please leave them in the comments below. I appreciate you taking the time to listen to my story, and for anyone feeling trapped in a career path outside of their passion, 
I hope this inspires you to put a plan into action. I'm not exceptionally special or wealthy. Rather, I'm just the guy that shifted his perspective of success to be happiness over anything else. 